during the initial concept design stage, uh, the overall statement of who or what character it is should be narrowed down. I mean, the, the main player of the game is obviously going to have a, a whole lot of backstory, but to, to get a really strong overall character, you need to distill all of those things about him down into a one line statement. Usually that will help kind of uh, focus I have swung on where you know, this character needs to head in the nonsense. Usually you'll get a brief, some kind of a backstory. And uh, for this one, I just kind of made up my own thing. And this is that one line thing. Design a sand creeps hailing from the desert seas of Rome. That's basically the, you know, all kinds of visions start popping into my head when I read this thing. And sometimes, the art director or the client will know exactly what they want, and they will they'll basically tell you this is exactly what we want. Other times, they'll kind of just let you go out and figure out what does this mean? What is a chain priest? What is Florida? What are the visitors? What are these places and things? And they'll kind of let you go and do free for all during the concept design phase. Um, and during this phase, you go out and you, you gather reference. You use the description and you start. You know, thinking, mulling over the words like priest, desert, seas, those keywords gave me a, a starting point for what I need to go search for. And some people will just use those words and they won't go any further, but let those things kind of be starting points and brainstorm bubble into other things, you know. Um, when I think of the deserts, I think of pyramids and the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. I think of scarab eagles and scorpions. And Roman Catholic priest guard for the priests, and mummified bodies, and zombies, and Middle Eastern cultures, and you talk about the desert in Chile. Um, and the Tyrant Sea brought visions of whirlpools to my mind. You know, when I think about these huge oceans, like, yeah, that's cool, those things are cool. You know? But I wondered, you know, the desert seas, what, uh, what would a whirlpool in a desert sea look like? How would that even be accomplished? And, uh, that made me think of the funnel shape that's kind of formed by the ant pine, which is a type of bug that digs like this pit right here. This thing here is a giant pit. And at the bottom is this little ant lion creature. And he lives down there, and when ants fall in, they can't get out. And he drags them in and eats them, that's dinner. So after looking through all of these reference images, an idea to help further the design of what this sand priest is came to mind. And it's, you know, perhaps the sand priests are they serve another function. They're not just like religious figures, but they're also like fairy here to this underworld. And um, like that guy Charon on the river Styx, where you pay him a coin and he take you across the river. Um, but rather than a boat, his mode of transport is a top of giant, you know, antlion type creature. And maybe the antlion trap is actually a portal to the underworld. You know, it's having those kind of idea bubbles will help, you know, create more well thought out design. You can kind of get the backstory through this one line statement and your reference to form a really cool looking character. Um, and when I grab the reference, typically I'll take and I'll put all of the reference that I gather into one big huge page and just look at that so that I'll have this cycle through it. You know, what was I thinking, you know, about how the hand lines, you know, tail is. If I've got it all there, I can see everything that pertains to the character all at once. And that will help inform the design, you know. Um, yeah, concept mm -hmm. design. Um, concept design, it, it varies from studio to studio, but usually it involves a guy, girl, drawing up some kind of cool idea based off of the backstory. Uh, but some studios are moving towards a, a hybridization of both 2D sketching and 3D sculpting during the concept design phase, because they're finding that Having a concept sculpt that the art director can take a look at in the round um, really helps alleviate a lot of the issues that come from having a really cool 2D concept but that doesn't work in 3D space. And um, sometimes the concept design guys, they don't have time to draw out all the details. Well, you with ZBrush, it makes it really fast to be able to accomplish those types of things. And the um, Z tool itself 
that you wind up creating some of the elements that might not be you know working for this particular design but you now have some of these pieces that maybe can be used on something else and now that you've got this concept sculpt you're basically kind of halfway done with the work for actually creating this particular asset to finally get it into the game which is a big win shaving the time off so silhouette, strong silhouette is extremely important for most games. The audience needs to recognize in a fraction of a second, is this a good guy, is it a bad guy, is it coming at me, is it going away? Um, and when you, do, when you do concepts, it's preferable on the first pass to have a wide variety. Some people will take and they'll create like one little head or one little body shape and then they'll duplicate it and then they'll iterate just a little bit on that and then they'll duplicate that and iterate just a little bit on that. That's called the evolutionary method. Um, when, you're, when you're doing this stuff, it's, it's a good idea to kind of just go wild. Just throw out all kinds of crazy ideas like this thing is radically different than this thing. You know, these things are all different from one another. Um, and by having the, that variety of silhouettes, we can potentially begin that process of combining different elements with each one of these things that are kind of cool, you know, to get a more solidified, awesome design. Um, and there's different ways of going about doing silhouettes. You can just, like this was just straight to the Photoshop stuff, you know, or you can do analog Sharpie markers on copy paper, it doesn't matter. Um, also, there's a Sketchbook Pro and, and ZBrush had the ability to work in symmetry. And uh, the human brain sees form in symmetry. When you just start putting, like with here, this is a plain 3D in ZBrush. And I've just got to turn ZAD and ZSub off. It's just poly paint. And the resolution is low. It's like a, you know, a 500 poly card. And I start drawing, and there's just some, this blob of color. Like, what the hell is that? You know? Once you start increasing the resolution and start drawing more and more, you'll start seeing things coming out of this symmetrical blob of shape. So that's the, the Rorschach effect. You just start, things just start coming out in your mind's eye. And they slowly evolve over time into other types of things. Um, this same thing, Sketchbook Pro was doing, you know, working in symmetry. And eventually, in games, uh, Oftentimes we're constrained by how much textual space that we have, how much UV space. And you got to kind of break, a lot of people don't want to do symmetry because symmetry just looks kind of in CG. But, you know, there are constraints in a production environment. So you have to figure out, okay, where can I add symmetry to this thing to maximize the amount of UV space and to get really good resolution on my textures and figure out where I can break it up. That's the challenge of how am I going to bust this thing into chunks? You know, what am I going to have to do UV-wise to actually get this design to work? Um, Adobe, you know, unfortunately doesn't have the ability to paint in symmetry the machine for Adobe. Maybe also there. And then we have a, a hybrid 2D, 3D style of, of working, where I, I did this guy here in, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then created these other two iterations off of him and, you know, grand total, you know, an hour and a half of work, maybe, tops. And then I could bring that in and I can start sketching over the top of what am I wanting to do with, with this character? Where do I want this guy to go? And, you know, this came at a later stage where I, you know, done a concept that looked kind of like this. I was like, yeah, I can see that work in this Maybe that, that ant lion thing that he rides on. Maybe it, the, the honeypot ant that uh, has this big, huge, orange, bulbous, you know, hind end can be used as kind of like bait or whatever to get the ant lion to dig that big, huge funnel down in the, the desert sea. You know, that's what the, the traveler that wants to go to the underworld has got to take with him to go and, you know, go into the underworld. But don't be afraid, you know, some people stay just straight up concept design is only 2D, it's only 2D. But that's not true. There's lots of places that are doing it, you know, 2D and 3D. It's, these are all just tools. Don't be afraid to have mixed media. You know, whatever gets the coolest design 
is is cool. You know, you don't have to worry that you're cheating if you're doing 3D or you're not, you know, doing enough if you're just doing something in 2D. I mean, they're all just tools. They're all your 2D. The more you draw, the better you're going to sculpt, and the more you sculpt, the better you're going to draw. The two feed into one. Don't try to shy away from either one. You know, you're going to be stronger in one or the other. But your goal should be to be strong in both because they're just tools. Um, so now I'll go over this thing. Um, this is a very crude representation of it. But the, the concept itself has really started to help me see a lot stronger uh, rhythm and gesture in my characters. And it's this notion called lines and hits. And basically, you want to pay attention to the acceleration of your curves and constantly look at your character in silhouette in ZBrush. And you can do that by hitting the letter V. That will flip it to black shaded where you just see black. And this line here, you know, it's just kind of boring. It doesn't, you know, it's just kind of lame. This one, it starts going here and there's this arc and then it starts to accelerate very rapidly. And that point of tension is called a hit, okay? And it's very dynamic. And you can, like, feel the, the movement of these lines. And that's what makes, like, the 2D stuff that Disney does so awesome is that it just has a lot of fluidity and rhythm and gesture. And you want to try to catch that same idea in your sculptures. And it's hard. It's very, very hard. It's easy to do in 2D. Well, not easy, but it's easier to do in 2D. To get it to work in three dimensions, that's the challenge of sculpting. You know, because you're basically taking these notions and you're putting them into you know Z and depth. You know. Um, so when you combine these two lame lines, you just get two lame lines. That does not there's no rhythm, there's no gesture, there's nothing. But the same thing holds true when you try to take these two dynamic curves and, and try to make something out of it. That looks like a drum stick. That doesn't look like <laughs> it doesn't work that way, you know? I mean, we're not trying to make chick here. We're trying to make really awesome characters. So what you want is to have a dynamic relationship between these two, where you've got, you know, a really dynamic curve, and it's balanced out with one that's less so. They're, you know, the S curves and C curves, these straights and, and curves really help lead the eye through the character. And that's, as a character artist, what you really want. You want to focus the eye of, of the player where you want them to go. So, um, another thing, really big thing, if you're going to be developing characters, is to have unified design. Um, we can mix and match different references to come up with our designs. Okay, paying close attention to shape and form development and understanding the logic of why a character would look the way that it does. It'll take us a long way towards achieving believability in the designs. Uh, and absorb as much information about the world around you. I mean, go out, read about bugs, read about spaceships, read about you know different environments. Read, and try to absorb as much information as you can. And in so doing, that will build not only the knowledge database of how the world works and how the things in it works, and it's very amazing, but it will also help you build a visual library of shapes. You know, like what does a beetle's carapace look like? You know, what does a scare beetle's carapace look like? What does the, the legs on an ant actually look like? I mean, some people, you know, will draw a little stick, but there's actually these shapes to them. And those types of shapes will make you see and feel that this character is real and that it's believable, you know? Um, if, if you don't do that, and you just start trying to take different pieces, like this is a camp line. <laughs> this is called Lego Boom, where it's tacked on, where you're just taking these two disparate entities and just plugging them into each other. And that just does not work. It, it, you really need to have rhythm and gesture for these characters and take different elements from all of the different references that you have and kind of pull them all together fluidly. You can't just um, and, and how you do that is by understanding, well, how does a, how does a, you know, spider's leg work? It's like a rock spider, right? That's why I looked it up. And that's why they're so creepy because of the way that they move. 
because it's how they're built and accomplished. Just how it, that stuff works. And taking that knowledge, you can use that to create these characters that are just really, really freaky. You know? And um, this was the sand prints that I created uh, using the different pieces of reference that I, that I found. Um, he's got like beetle, you know, things going on. He's got the carapace on his chest, and you know, on, on the back he's got you know little shell type things. And the beetles have these little spiky thorn things that come off of their legs. So implementing those types of things throughout really help make a, a solidified, believable design. It looks, it's got elements of a person. It's got two arms, it's got two eyeballs, it's got a mouth, you know. But it also has this, wow, this thing is like this bug creature looking guy, you know. And you've got elements of, you know, pharaoh type neck pieces and the, the big beetle and these types of things that I pulled from all the different references and they mashed together really give a, a sense of this could be a sand priest from the desert seas of Toronto. You know? And this is just one idea, you know, but now that this concept sculpt is done, I mean, this didn't take very long at all, he's basically done. I mean, I could pose him up and, and do, you know, a concept design piece on something that's not quite as fleshed out as this and use that to kind of sell the idea. You know? and Basically, you create a layer, an un unposed layer, and then you create another layer with it posed up so that you can always get back to your original guy. Um, but like I'm saying, there's, you know, he's got rhythm that goes throughout. You know, there's one line that feeds into another line that feeds into another line. It's not all drumsticky, and, you know, it, it, you can feel rhythm and gesture throughout. And like I was talking about the unified design. That's one thing, if you don't take anything else away from this, understanding the unified design will take you very, very far. That will really help you create characters that are memorable. You know, not ones that are just like, eh, that's the pant one is cheap. So this was you know, this guy, that's high him. Um, but this was another example of, you know, taking just a quick base mesh and concepting out this little kid that lives in the jungle, you know, he's like this little warrior guy, and, you know, creating different ideas based off of him, you know, like how just hybridization of the methodology, where I'm drawing over, in Photoshop, drawing over a, a 3D sketch. Um, and I, I kind of like some of the elements from all of these different ones, and uh, but I, he needed to have this sword shot thing. You know, so I went and researched slingshots, like how did like slingshots back in the day, like daily life, like how did that work? Because you know, I got my kids a little slingshot crowd, you know, busted tree lights and stuff, but not really. But um, how, how did the old school work? And how it worked is they basically, they would wear it like, kind of like a ring, and it would be a long rope that would come off, and there would be this uh, leather piece in the middle, and they would hold it, and they would swing it around and let it go. And they would still have their sling, and the rock would be, you know, the enemy would have the rock in the head. So, you know, taking that type of stuff, but my guy needed to swing through some trees, so, you know, had it tied off on the arm. Um, taking those things helped, you know, come up with this final design for this character. You know, just kind of sketch. And it came, sometimes you'll, you'll hit your 2D concept, bang on the money. And then other times, it, it's fluid. Kind of change stuff and make it cooler. You know, maybe you just hadn't imagined this when you were at the 2D stage. And that's the beauty of ZBrush is that it really allows for you to express your creativity and not be hampered. You know. Um, and here's some other examples where I just took this creature sculpt. He was supposed to live in some cave, and he was like this crazy predator type guy. You can see that with you know, and he's fast and aggressive. And kind of like the, the quadruped, you know, he's ready to rock and roll. He's going to come out and, and devour. And, you know, he, he uses sonar-like capabilities, like a bat or whatever. So he doesn't even have eyes. He just goes off the sound. And, you know, you can see, you know, the, the curves. And I'm probably looking at them now, but have accentuated them even further, you know. Um, that gives a sense of speed and aggressiveness. 
and then this was the the final concept design piece to sell this character. Like here's this guy, you know, this is what it was. Um, and then uh, from there, I was able to take and bake off some of that and and create the final in-game asset. You know, it's like four thousand tries of one K map or something, but. Um, they would have like these little glowy bits that kind of in the subterranean world would attract like bioluminescent, you know, elements that attract the crate to it and then it goes out and it eats, but it's got like this flesh that's white because it's living in the caves all the time. You know. um, and then here's another one, but this is this is an example, kind of an example of tag dog. You know, you've got this alien, and then you got Levi jeans stuck on the ground. You know, this is the kind of, you know, not so great design. And, and that, it's a learning experience. The more you do it, the more you'll see, you'll go back and you'll look at stuff that you did previously. I got this a couple of years ago. And I go back now, it's like, dude, you know? But that's okay. That, that helps you doing, plowing through this stuff over and over and getting that mileage I was talking about will, you know, help you start to see earlier rather than later, like, oh, this is a bad design choice. I shouldn't do this. You know, the color version of it. You know, kind of got the crazy buggy, you know, crazy buggy, orangey, and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, another um, same type of deal where you can um, take this concept design piece, and he's got a, a standard T-pose layer. And I can get him back into T-pose, and if they like this idea, I created this guy in, like, a day and a half banging out some really quick concept. There's things that I would change, but the overall idea is like this death guy, you know, that's going to you know, do some damage. Um, but yeah, I think that it was my portion of the, the talk and I hope that it would be more than you guys. Very cool. <laughs> Like he just took a 
big hit of meth or crack or whatever it might be. It'd be funny if maybe he had a possum or some little sidekick that potentially sold him this stuff. Um, so this is done using uh, ZBrush, Topo Gun, Modo, Photoshop, Indu, Marmoset. Um, there's a lot of text here, so I'm not, I'm not sure how easy this is going to read. Um, so, you know, obviously this, the first step is come up with an idea. Um, and sometimes it doesn't have to be fully concocted in your head. Sometimes that's the freedom of, of working is, you know, the ideas that maybe made sense at one time evolve or completely get scrapped and replaced as you're building something. So I started with just opening up ZBrush, bringing in a Dynamesh sphere, and then just started pulling shapes out, bending and contorting stuff. And just, you know, kind of, the, the beauty with stuff like Dynamesh is that it, it's about as close to digital play as you can get. So, you know, this guy starts as a sphere. I take two more spheres, pop them on the side of his head, read Dynamesh, and you're literally building things on the fly. Whereas maybe six or seven years ago, you would, not even that long ago, uh, just a few years ago, you would have to build a lot of base meshes in your 3D packages. And that just inherently slows the process down. So any opportunity you can get to just on the fly start creating stuff um, is always going to be a big win. So uh, so this guy starts off you know, at a very base level like that. Um, and something here that I recommend that everyone does is uh, build a uh, little custom brush palette for yourself. Um, it's way easier than digging through and finding the brushes that you would typically use. Um, I usually keep a very simple amount of brushes. Most of the time I'm using clay tubes, move, move topological, pinch, DM standard, and then H polish. Um, and that's just about 75 to 80% of all my construction, just done with those brushes. Um, so what you can do is you can actually build a custom palette and then uh, hotkey it to your Cintiq or your Wacom so that you can always just pop it up, go to brush, and then continue going. Um, some people like to put them just like on the side of their of their monitor or the side of their, their document in ZBrush, that's fine too. Just, you know, any way you can just kind of boil down all that stuff and just make it a little more accessible is always going to speed you up. Um, so basically, I continue dynameshing this guy, and this is all just a continuation of taking spheres, taking cylinders, uh, shaping them, literally just putting them all together, dynamesh, do it again. Uh, one thing that I do here, it's maybe a little hard to read on this, um, this image, but I keep some of his main components separate until I've really defined like, kind of what gesture or pose I want to do. This guy started off with just kind of this slouch kind of, you know, look to him. And it wasn't until later that I decided, oh, like I need to fix that and actually get him into more of a rig pose. Um, but for the time being, you know, I'm keeping his arms separate from his body, separate from his head. And then once all those elements are really defined and solidified, I'm happy with it, I kind of meshed all of that together. And now I have, I have the actual base mesh for this guy. Um, so you know, once the once the pose is established, I start blocking out all the clothing and assets. Um, and most of this is again just built off of mesh extractions or more dynameshing. Um, sometimes both. Um, you know, whereas maybe a few years ago you would have to go back into a 3D program to build some of the stuff like this hat. You know, now you can just build it in ZBrush. Um, the hat is literally just made from a, uh, a cube that's dynameshed and then the little top piece, like the actual front piece, is just extracted from that, and then the, the bill is, a, is another um, primitive that's bended, contorted, dynamashed, they're put together. Then you literally just duplicate the, the main portion of the hat and um, scale it down, set it as a dynamesh subtraction, put those together, and then dynamesh it again. Now you've got you know, the hollowed part of your hat instead of just a big blob. Um, a lot of the, the facial hair and stuff was done with some custom insert brushes that are just uh, basically like single hair brushes that you can use. Um, all the new insert brushes that came out in the last year or two have been extremely helpful. Because um, before, if you wanted to put, you know, little 
buttons and stuff like that, typically you either have to make one in ZBrush and then duplicate it, move it all over the place, and kind of it's like a real pain because it's not snapped to anything. But with some of the new insert brushes, you can just pop it, set it to snap. It's always going to snap perfectly to the body. It just speeds everything up. Um, a lot of the mechanical gear, it, the original iteration I was doing on this, I thought, okay, this guy's going to be like a dumb redneck mechanic. And uh, so I'm going to give him a bunch of, you know, kind of going back to what Wayne was saying, you know, uh, I'm looking at the design, uh, you know, this guy's supposed to be kind of simplified. The idea in my head is like, this guy should be designed as if he were going to be a 2D character. So like, you know, if you look at um, a lot of 2D uh, cartoon characters from the past or even now, they boil things down and try to get to like that main message because it's a real pain to redraw something a million times over. So I tried to keep that same kind of mentality in my head as I was designing this guy. And I felt like the just the gear was just a little too much. Um, but it was all made using Shadowbox and just alphas and a little bit more of uh, dynamic stuff. So what I ended up doing was, uh, I actually ended up uh, simplifying it and just going with a simple hammer. The hammer alone is enough to convey to someone like, this guy does some kind of construction or mechanical work. Um, so after I had all the elements laid out, I decided to uh, go ahead and tell myself, all right, like right, I'm going to take this thing a little bit further than just ZBrush. So uh, I went ahead and I had to repose him. So um, I went in and just you know set some layers up, moved the shoulder, moved the arms up a little bit, straightened his pose up just a little bit, um, just so that when I, I rigged it, um, it would be a little more friendly for that. And uh, I poly painted this guy a little bit. Um, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, and um, I sometimes poly paint stuff just to get a real base level. It's by no means like the final texture or diffuse for for my characters, but it kind of uh, you know it, it's a good like starting point. And at the very least, it, it allows me to think about color scheme, color theory as I'm iterating on the sculpt. Um, so, you know, start blocking out the colors, and uh, it's pretty simple for this guy. Just uh, some flats, a little bit of minor variation, a little mass by cavity, and pretty much there. So now I'm like taking everything out, I'm going to start retopologizing it. I mean, everyone, I'm sure, here you know, knows what that is and what that requires. Um, I use uh, Taco Gun for that. and. Uh, since this isn't really a, uh, a piece that's going to go necessarily into anything more than my own portfolio, you know, I, I give myself the liberty to, to get a little more crazy with the polys. Because um, the idea in my head is like, oh, maybe I'll do some kind of awesome facial rigging at some point and I'll want enough birds there to support that. But everything gets uh, retopologized and then brought in for the unwrap and kind of going back to like you know this idea of symmetry and how you know sometimes people are like oh symmetry you know looks bad in a production environment sometimes you have to pick and choose your battles so um, the idea of like doing a minor variation on a character's face where oh I'm gonna like you know move his eye just a little bit down or move his eyebrow just a little bit up um, if you're going to do that kind of asymmetry in a lot of aspects, unless you're going for just hyper, hyper realism, you should consider just um, only doing that if there's going to be a real benefit to it. So if I'm going to put a scar on the side of a guy's face, maybe that makes sense. But if I'm just going to do like a minor little tweak and variation, it probably makes more sense for me to just mirror that if I wanted to. Um, you can see here, like there's elements that are all mirrored. I mirrored the ear, I mirrored uh, parts of the hat and uh, mirrored the legs, the arms, the boots, uh, mirrored the eyes. I mean, there's some things that just are no-brainers, but, um, you know, sometimes you can, you can really save yourself a lot of space. And if you're doing your own portfolio pieces, you know, maybe you have a little more flexibility with that, but in production, you know, sometimes you're giving, you're giving very clearly defined parameters and to maximize the fidelity of the resolution of what you're doing. <coughs> want to kind of start thinking about that. For this guy, I did it 
I unwrapped them at 4K by 2K. Um, I wanted more resolution than a, than a 2K map, but less than 4K, because he's not going to be so detailed that you see his skin pores and things of that sort. So, uh, you know, just trying to logically lay everything out. I try to keep everything kind of in the same space, so I don't necessarily... I try not to unwrap like a, a, sh a sleeve for an arm and put it in the other the other side of the of the UV sheet than where the rest of the torso might be. I try to keep everything kind of localized. Um, so you know, most of the heads here, most of the hair and minor ears here, and most of the body. Um, so then, uh, you know, you get everything done, you set everything out, uh, start faking it. So I started thinking, okay, maybe I'll put this thing into Unity. Uh, so I baked everything in X normal off of that tangent calculator, um, and you know I'm, I'm baking just the the poly paint from ZBrush, the normal, the cavity, the AO, and uh, and then I usually do sometimes I just do it in Modo. I'll, I'll um, bring in some of the high polys, just assign a material to it, give it a generic color, and then bake those out so that I have uh, basically a selection set that's you know, really easy to use. Um, so then, uh, you know, now you go to like the texturing phase, and everyone has like a, just a ton of different ways to, to go about texturing. And uh, I'm not going to try to say that my way is the best way, or that another person's way is the best way. This is just kind of how I how I depend to do it. Um, for a, a lot of texturing is really dependent on the art direction for your character, and. At this point, you should kind of have an idea in your head of what that is. So, have I been doing a realistic character? Have, am I doing a cartoony character? Am I doing some kind of creature design? Am I doing like a hybrid of sorts? Because those things will directly influence how you texture the thing. If I made a cartoony character and then put a bunch of kind of photo uh, textural elements into the into the diffuse, it might create a little bit of a clash. Um, for me, I wanted to go with these kind of saturated colors, um, clearly blocked out, you know, piece by piece, so that you know, the, the, the different parts of them really stand out from each other. Um, so I go in with that, and it, for this guy, I, I'm really just using a lot of just solid color layers with some mask and building it up that way. Um, I'll use a little bit of tile patterns and textures, but I set up to a, a lower opacity. It's start building things that you don't necessarily see but you feel in the texture, if that makes sense. Um, so that way the, 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 the texturing isn't just overly simple. It's got a little bit of variation to it, but it's not just knocking you over the head. Um, I usually set up my PSD to have um, you know a lot of I'm, I'm a little bit of a stickler for how I handle these guys because, especially in a production environment, there will be times where you're going to have to open up someone else's PSD, and I've seen some that are you know, really well organized, and I've seen some where it's just like this layer and then that layer, and it's all just like this ugly stack, and you're like, how the hell do I work with this thing? And you literally have to reverse engineer someone's PSD. And for me, it's no, just Take five minutes, name your stuff. It's not a big deal. So layer 179. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like it gets insane. So you know, I start with just the baked out diffuse. I make a folder above that. It's just my base level color corrections. Those are hue saturations and level adjustments. And then once I have that kind of, uh, once I have all those colors working well together, and I'm doing all of this in Marmoset. Uh, something that's, I think really important to mention is. Sometimes people will texture stuff based on what they see in their 3D viewport, but that will be often very different from what you see in your game engine. So my personal recommendation is to bake your stuff out, immediately export your character, get it in the game engine, set up your material, plug that stuff in, then start viewing it. Because what this character looks like in Modo is vastly different from what it looks like in Marvel Set. And chances are, it's probably vastly different from what it would look like in Unreal or Unity. You know, there would be, there might be a moment in the future where I decide to take this into one of those engines, and I would have to start tweaking things because the differences between engines is large enough that you can make things look good or bad. 
So I'm, you know, I'm building everything up, and in each one of these folders, I'm kind of subtly applying those colors. I'm applying um, a little bit of texture overlay. I'm, I'm just slowly building the thing up. And I mean, as you can see, I mean, this isn't like a super complex texture by any means, and it's purposely done. If I was doing a realistic character, I would go for more of that granular detail. I'd put more of that kind of skin pour and, and you know, cloth uh, textural detail into the normal map and into the uh, into the fuse. Um, so you know, you, you just want to like kind of build it up that way. And I, another thing that I do is uh, I make a, a folder that's just called AO. And inside of that, I put all my AO passes, cavity, all that stuff. And uh, one thing I do is I actually, I set all those to different, you know, multiplies or uh, opacity levels, but I, I make sure to mask off all the skin and actually apply a gradient map to that because harsh AO black on skin tends to look weird. Um, it just makes the character look a little unnatural. But, you know, you still want that kind of surface shading, so just applying a, uh, a gradient map on top of that and then either overlaying that or playing with its opacity can really let you keep some of that, that AO detail without going into harsh blacks all over your skin. Um, and then, this is kind of the end of the, end of the guy. Um, I get, the, I, I get everything in, you know, I've, I've made my spec. Um, for this guy, I did a colored spec. Sometimes people just do grayscale spec. It really depends on, on what you want to do. Um, some elements of him, I, I played around with doing gloss, but this was also a learning experience for me. I never really used Marmoset before. And, you know, kind of wanted to see what, what it was all about, because, you know, you see people work online using, wow, that's really amazing. and. Uh, and it is amazing. I, I feel like there were moments of working on this thing where I felt like it was doing too much of the work for me. It's almost like it has a make awesome button and I pressed it and then suddenly everything looked really cool. Um, I ended up uh, in Marmoset uh, applying a skin, so he has a couple of material IDs. His skin has a skin material ID and then his body is a, is a separate material ID. And the skin material ID in Marmoset allows you to start plugging in some subsurface scattering. You can play around with some translucency. Um, for that, I made, I made some masks to you know, control like the level of scattering on his face. Um, so I really wanted to try to get a little bit of that kind of Pixar kind of quality to, to his skin. Um, and in some ways, I think I succeeded. In some ways, I think it's you know, it's always, there's always room for improvement. Um, so, you know, I get him in there and I got him posed. I, I, I rigged and posed him in Moto, which was another learning experience because I, I use Moto, you know, pretty much all the time for all my modeling, but I never tried rigging anything in there because it's a fairly new feature to, to Moto. And, you know, like, you know, if you're going to pose something, there's two kind of ways you can go about it. You can either pose it in ZBrush and then export it out and basically blue poly everything from a posed version, or you can do it at a natural kind of rig pose. You can build a really quick, dirty kind of rig. And these are rigs that would not necessarily uh, work in production, and any TV or rigger would look at it and laugh. But you can, you know, just real easily set up some FK bones just so you can bend the guy into a position. Um, I was no, by no means trying to build a rig that was going to allow me to do walk cycles and facial animation or anything like that. It was literally like a 30 minute job, just boom, 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 and then skin it and then there you go. And I didn't even really play around with clean weights. I just kind of bent him into a pose and if there was anything that looked weird, I just kind of went in with my by myself and just fixed those verts and those polys as needed. And then uh, went ahead and just like made all the ground plane stuff and, and these guys are basically all the same processes. The only guy that I, I modeled externally was the TV, but then I brought the TV into uh, into uh, ZBrush and converted it to a Dynamesh so that I could apply some wood and some other details to it. And, uh, you know, this little possum guy, I ended up making him in you know, a couple hours just off of a bunch of 
uh, Dynamesh stuff put together, and then his low poly, I cheated. I just um, I did it with zebra mesher, so I didn't even do a, a real retopologize on that. I just zebra meshed it. Um, it is not the most friendly thing for deformation because it, it, at least my experience so far, it gives you a bunch of these kind of spiral guys, which are really unfriendly for trying to uh, rig or unwrap anything. So hopefully in a future iteration they can fix that because then you know it'll speed everyone up tremendously. I did the same thing with him, ground plane, all that stuff, made the little crates, and, uh, and that was pretty much it. And uh, you know, I think I, I learned a lot from working on this. And uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully you guys can take away from it uh, what you will, and hopefully it helps you guys as well going forward. I guess uh, we'll do, I guess we have like 10 minutes, we can do a little Q&A. Any questions? What did you lay out your UV pieces with? What did you use for that? Uh, I mean, it was just done in Moto. No. Just unwrapped it in Moto. Um, it has really good UV features. Um, but, you know, it has like a 3D relax and some other things that are, I think they're actually a fairly common thing in those packages. With Maya's. The layout is always kind of soft in it. Well, I, I learned 3D on Maya, and at least back in 2005, it's UV sucked really bad. Yeah, well, they still do. <laughs> I haven't really played with it since then, so I assume maybe it's a little better. Um, not a question, but um, I know you guys are talking about on Silhouette, there's also a free program online called Alchemy. It's cool for making the this is a <laughs> yeah random random shapes. A lot of people they they're like, how do you get ideas? How do you come up with these ideas for these things? And I I'm fond of you know, the uh, pick things out of the clouds type methodology. Alchemy is great for that because you can just kind of put in random squiggly lines or whatever and stroke and you know, all of this weird. Stuff just all over the page, and it's in you may work in symmetry as well. And you'll just start seeing really cool stuff coming out of those shapes. A lot of that has been built into Krita, also. What's that? Krita, have you heard of that? No, it's another uh, really good painting package that's open source. Oh, very cool. Check it out. Check it out. Yeah, that's the one thing about Photoshop that I don't understand is that they have not built in any kind of symmetry functions. Mm -hmm. They're like the, the de facto number one painting package and they don't have symmetry. That's how we get some. Yeah, it's like this up. head work around there. Yeah, yeah. I've seen actions as well that kind of every time you make a stroke, it'll run the action and then it flips and makes a layer and it marches down and it's just like, oh, it's got a short symmetry. Yeah. That seems like that would get a little intensive at times too, because you're, you know, at least for me, especially at that kind of concepting stage, you're kind of just, you know, hacking away at everything. You got this little action that's like yeah, it's running, 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 running. Seems like it's like a <laughs> it sounds like a recipe for crash. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. For concept artists, if you were trying to get in, what kind of portfolio piece do you focus on? Like, what kind of example pieces? Silhouettes, uh, front study. Well, if you're going just for concept design, because that's kind of a, the industry is kind of in a state of flux now, where what that actually is is kind of changing a little bit because of ZBrush. But if you're going for a straight, you know, 2D concept designer type guy, I mean, you're going to be drawing a bunch of everything. I mean, you need to be able to draw fireworks. You need to know perfect. You need to know anatomy. You need to be able to draw characters. You need to be able to silhouette. Be able to draw weapons, you need to be able to draw doorways, you need to be able to draw pretty much everything because the concept designers are designing the entire world. The, the game's happening. All from 
the, the rocks on the floor to the, the tops of the steeples of the churches. I mean, everything from top to bottom, they're developing that. They're coming up with the ideas for that. And that's why it's very, very important to go and research and absorb as much about this world as you possibly can, all the art history that you can, just all the different cultures that are out there, and find out what makes things look arrogant. What makes things have this air of mystique? What makes things look aggressive? You know, it's, and, and that only comes through researching and studying. You'll find that the really, really, really good concept designers aren't dudes that just drew a lot. They have went out and studied a lot about how the world works, just about all of these different things that you learn about. They're very, very smart, intelligent people. That's typically what I think. That they really understand, you know, a lot about different parts of the world, different cultures, bugs, you know, how, how you know, outer space, like how, how how does gravity work? You know, I mean, it's like all of this stuff that you wouldn't think really well, that's not possible, you know. But those things inform their their design decisions overall, and and by studying those things, you're building up that visual library, and the more the more stuff that you have in your visual library, the bigger the repertoire you have to draw from for creating really cool designs that kind of sell, this is this bug creature, or this is you know, this deep sea monster guy. And because you went out and you understand how this is I think it's also important to have a, a level of diversity to your portfolio. And that goes, that's across the board, whether you're concept or character or environment or props um, at the student level and guys trying to break in it's it's often and it makes total sense because I think we're all guilty of it of trying to play to your strengths so um, you know sometimes you'll see uh, just a lack of variety in portfolios and so you know a guy might be good at doing creatures but you know maybe hasn't quite perfected doing like the simple anatomy like the boring man or woman and those things really impress me when I see just a just a guy or a female that's either designed or sculpted and can influence some personality into that character because sometimes it's about the stance sometimes it's about the clothing the person's wearing those are at, a lot of times those are a lot more impressive to me than the wing demon bad monster guy with you know, six heads yeah, because those things are always going to be visually interesting at some level. If you actually take something as mundane as just like the person you see walking down the street and then represent them either at a concept or a 3D stage and make them appealing, like, oh wow, this is really well done, I really like this, then that tells me that when you're handed the idea for that queen demon creature guy that you're going to take it to levels far beyond what I can even think about. Um, just like that diversity of, of portfolio is really important. For a concept guy, I think it would be beneficial to do characters and environments and props because um, I, I think we can both speak for the competitiveness of getting into the character side of things and kind of really challenging. And I actually came, I came into the industry as a environment guy and kind of did that for a few years until I got the opportunity. And sometimes that's the route that people go. Um, so just having that diversity will open a door for you. It might not be exactly the position you want, but it's a pathway to the position. Yeah, you know, just have to, like I didn't start out with games. I started out doing films and commercials and stuff. Doing hard surface vehicles and things like that, and eventually just gravitated towards, I started learning that. You know, started learning these basics of the rhythm and just you're taking a regular dude. If you got just a regular Joe Blow guy there, but he's standing and you can see this rhythm throughout his body, that really tells me that you have a strong grasp on the fundamentals. You have you know how to make a cake, you know how to make a cookie. You know, all the sprinkles on the top of it, they're just sprinkles. You know, if the cookies all burn up and you're trying to put sprinkles on it. <laughs> it's going to be a part of the it's not going to be, it's not going to be good, you know, and a lot of, a lot of 
you know, artists just starting out, they want to get all poor bags and bags of spray paint on stuff, and you got to kind of take the time and learn your fundamentals, learn anatomy, you know, learn rhythm and gesture, learn that type of stuff. Because that will that'll get you in the door a lot faster than you know, knowing what button to press into your brush or any of that kind of stuff. That's it. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys.